Okay, I will uh, restart for the, the third lecture. Um, and now the difference is that we'll get rid of this term and see uh, what we can say. So in general, there are still many open questions about uh, this kind of equations. So these equations are simply Wasserstein gradient flows of convex functionals. Um, but to find uh, uh, some uh, results, we'll come back to the case of two-layered neural network because we see that there is a nice structure in this case that can be then generalized to other problems and give us some globally convergent uh, mean field dynamics. So let us go back to the case of two-layer uh, neural networks. So I will rem remind uh, the, uh, the equations. So remember that we have a predictor H mu which is given by the integral of phi w uh, x d mu of w. So we parameterize our two-layer neural network with a probability measure mu. Mu was in r to the d plus one. So now I come back to the case where the variable is in d plus one dimension. Uh, while in the previous lecture it was d, this is nothing uh, important, but it's just more convenient. And where phi was this function, which I wrote in the previous lecture, A of sigma B transpose X, where W, which is this couple AB, it lives in R times RD, so RD plus one. Uh, sorry, mu is a probability measure on RD plus one with finite second moment. I will still keep this uh, restriction. And uh, if I take f, my objective function to be this empirical risk of h mu, we computed yesterday that v mu of w, so this is the first variation of my functional f, at this formula, uh, formulation, one over n sum from i equals one to n of L prime y i h mu of x i uh, phi of w x i. So this is just uh, by doing the chain rule, the formula we get for the first variation in the case of two-year neural network. So not, let us look at the ReLU case where in the case of ReLU, each of sim the simple function is of the following form a max between zero and B transpose X. So here, the, there is always a bias in the, uh, or an intercept, but uh, I include it in the vector X so that, to simplify notations, but this is really a, a general two-layer value neural network. And here we notice that this, pro this function has two homogeneity in the variable W. Okay, so that's the main, uh, the, uh, the only uh, structure that we will use. So now I will make this assumption that uh, phi of W, so this is the function uh, as a function of W, is too homogeneous, so too positive, positively too homogeneous, which means that phi of lambda Wx equals lambda squared phi of Wx, so this is for all uh, lambda positive, that's why I say positively too homogeneous. The two is because I have a square here, and this is for all omega and all x. So now we'll consider a neural network with the two homogeneity of W. Here, this is because when I multiply omega by, uh, sorry, W by lambda, I multiply both A and B by lambda, so we get lambda square. And I will also uh, assume that phi is C1 or even more regularity. Uh, so this excludes uh, the case of ReLU neural network. But uh, uh, to deal with ReLU, it's possible you would need to deal with the population loss against a smooth, like a, a density of inputs that allows to somehow get rid of the non-smoothness of ReLU. And you need also some specific initialization where the input weights and output weights are the same norm at initialization. If you have this kind of uh, technical assumptions, you can still 
uh, have rigorous results with, with the value activation function, but to simplify thing, I will just take a C1 phi, which is too homogeneous. This is like a stylized version of the two-layer two neural network. And you see that when phi is too homogeneous, then V mu is too homogeneous for any mu. Why? Because the dependency in W is only here in the phi, okay? So I have a evolution of this form where the drift is a gradient of a too homogeneous function. And that's when we have a certain uh, nice property. And in, in that case, again, we'll get some uh, global convergence guarantees. Uh, so the first step will be do a projection on the sphere of the dynamics. So you see, when you have two homogeneity, the uh, radial behavior of my function phi is very simple. So in fact, I can only, like, the, the function phi is only characterized by the way it behaves on the sphere. So let me define the sphere uh, SD, which is the dual definition, W, uh, sorry, set of W in RD plus one, such that uh, the norm is one. And we will use the spherical coordinate Uh, so W J, I will write it as R J times eta J with R J in R plus and eta J in the sphere. Okay, this is a bit small. Eta J is a vector in the sphere and R J is uh, the radius. So this is just spherical uh, coordinates in uh, dimension d plus one. So to simplify a bit the derivation, I will consider a measure mu, mu t, which is a sum of atoms. Just to do not to deal only with this PD formalism, uh, the continuous formalism, this is some maybe more easy to understand what's going on with atoms. So I take my uh, particle uh, gradient descent, gradient flow, Remember that it's obtained by replacing uh, the measure mu in F by this type of formula in doing the gradient flow in W. Now the question is how does it evolve in spherical coordinates? Uh, okay, first let me start with a remark that the predictor, so H mu of X, this is one over M sum of phi of wj x. So this is one over m, the sum of rj squared, because I have two homogeneity in w, phi of eta j x. So here I see the sphere as a subset of rd, uh, rd plus one, and I have my function phi is still well defined. And this, uh, I will call it um, H of nu of X with nu, nu T, sorry, nu T. This is now a measure on the sphere, which is a sum of weighted delta Dirac masses, okay? Where each Dirac at position eta J on the sphere uh, eta i, let's say, uh, as weight r i squared. Okay, so now this is a non-negative measure on the sphere. So this is, a, we can do a general operator that takes any probability measure and project it in a too homogeneous way on the sphere. But let's stick to this discrete case. And now uh, let's try to describe the dynamics purely in terms of the projected measure. So uh, evolution on the sphere. Uh, so we claim that we have the evolution of Rj. So I remove the time dependency. It's Rj of t, okay? So Rj prime, it will be given by minus two R 
J uh, V new T at eta J and eta J prime. So this is the uh, spherical component of my uh, position of the particle is given by minus gradient on the sphere. So the, the, the spherical gradient, I will explain what it is, of V nu T at eta J. So this is simply the, project, the gradient of V, which I project on the sphere. So this is how it's obtained. The identity minus eta J, eta J transpose of uh, applied to the gradient, the usual gradient of V nu T at eta J. So let us, so this gives somehow a new dynamics over non-negative measures on the sphere, where the evolution is a multiplicative update on the weight and a standard update on a uh, gradient update on the positions. So let me just check this formula, show you that this is equivalent to uh, the particle gradient flow when we have two homogeneity. So let us um, look at Rj times eta j prime. So I want to show that Rj eta j prime is the same as Wj prime. So that I have a consistency that is described the same dynamics. Uh, so this is Rj prime eta j plus Rj eta j prime. I replace this with the equation which I claim or the good one, that's what we want to verify. This is minus two or I uh, or J squared uh, V nu T of eta J. And then I have the second term minus or J times the identity minus eta J eta J transpose of the gradient of V nu T at eta J. Uh, the first step in the verification is to notice that V mu T is exactly the same as V nu T because uh, the, the predictors parameterized by this non-negative measure on the sphere and the one parameterized by this probability measure on RD plus one are the same. And so you can see that uh, the V, the right V somewhere yeah, here, they, they, they will be exactly the same function because it only depends on the measure via here. When I write uh, V nu T, it's the same as, as, as V of nu T. And now we'll just reorganize a little bit. I have minus Rj V of nu T eta J. This is the term that comes from the identity here. And then I have minus Rj times uh, two Rj V eta uh, V nu T eta J. And I have the last term here, minus eta j, eta j transpose gradient of v, t, eta j. Is it correct? Okay. So here, Ah, sorry, here this is this term, which I'm, uh, this term which I'm taking. So there is a gradient here. And then I have, okay, this term here and this term here. So this, since uh, the gradient of a uh, two homogeneous function is one homogeneous, it's a gradient, you lose one degree of homogeneity. This is exactly uh, minus gradient of multi at Wj, because Rg times eta j is Wj. And this, it is zero by, uh, so this is a usual standard uh, property of homogeneous function, which is sometimes called the Euler uh, uh, formula for homogeneous function, which tells us that the uh, radial gradient is proportional to uh, the value of the functional at that point. I could prove it, it's one line, you just, you take this formula, okay, you can maybe do it by heart, by, uh, in your head, you differentiate this with W on the sphere and at lambda equals to one. So you differentiate it in lambda. Uh, here you get W transpose uh, gradient of, the, of phi. And here, if you differentiate in lambda, you have just two lambda 
but at lambda equals to one, this is just two of phi. So this, this tells us that two times my homogeneous function is equal to uh, the gradient. And, and that's why, I mean, yeah, yeah, okay, that's, yeah. Yeah, I think I made, uh, I think this one is too much. Ah, here, it's LJ, eta J. Uh, let me check uh, the computations. Two or J, uh, ah, yes, indeed, thanks. Ah, yes, because here this is eta J, yeah, thanks, okay. Or J, eta J. Then I have RJ, everything is good, RJ. And here I have RJ, there's no uh, thing here. Ita, ita. Ah, okay, and then I have, uh, okay, I can take this eta outside because it multiplies this one as well. All right. <laughs> so this is the, uh, the, the good uh, the, uh, property that we have for homogeneous functions. So this is zero and we get here gradient of V at mu t of omega j. So this is uh, direct computations. And um, what this tells us is that we have, when we project our uh, Wasserstein gradient flow, like our PDE, which is now uh, first defined on RD plus one to the sphere with these two homogeneous projection, we have an evolution in the space of measures. And this one, it turns out to behave quite well. And I will prove several uh, results uh, I will, sorry, mention several results for this. So let me generalize this now beyond the case of two-layer neural network. So uh, more general case. This gives us an algorithm to optimize over non-negative measures on some d-dimensional manifold. So now I can take uh, the setting which I have, which we have there, but I replace RD by by um, a Riemannian manifold, which is here the sphere. Which will be a d-dimensional. I say Riemannian manifold because I need a notion of gradient, which is here the gradient on the sphere. And our goal now would be to solve like we take f, a functional defined on the space of non-negative measures on x. We discretize uh, the measure. So I let me stick to the notation new for measures which are non-negative uh, and not normalized. I discretize it as a sum of weighted masses. So here, AI is RJ squared, just a simple change of variable. And if I look at these equations, this gives me, this suggests an algorithm to minimize uh, such functions, which is what is the so-called conic particle gradient uh, flow. And the equations are as follows. A prime J at time T, so it's always depending on T. For each particle, the evolution of its weight will be given by minus four I, AJ of uh, V nu, te, nu, nu at time T eta J. Why do I have a four? Because uh, A is R square, and so A prime will be uh, two R prime R, okay? And two R prime R gives me minus four times A times V. But this factor here, four, it does not matter at all. In fact, it could be replaced by anything. Uh, and eta j prime will be minus the gradient. So now this is the gradient of a function on the Riemannian manifold at eta j. So the important part is that we have multiplicative updates on the mass and standard uh, updates on the positions. 
Uh, maybe let me also mention, because that was our starting point in the lectures, how these updates correspond to uh, doing gradient descent on the parameterized function. So if I have f m of theta, this function f of uh, the parameterized measure with uh, theta, the set of weights and positions, then these updates, they correspond to um, aj prime of t, okay, it's always depending on t, will be minus four uh, aj, the gradient in aj of fm at theta of t, and eta j prime will be minus uh, one over aj, the gradient in eta j of fm at theta of g. So this is the preconditioner I was mentioning in the first lecture. Why do I need to divide by one over aj? Because when I take the gradient of fm in, AJ, in uh, xj, I have a factor aj that will come up, which is not here in the equation that we care about. So we need to divide by uh, this. So now I don't care about this factor four. In fact, this gives similar dynamics. What I can choose is a factor alpha, which uh, controls how much the position change while uh, the weights change by a certain factor. Uh, okay? so this is the dynamics of conic particle gradient flow. Um, and one last thing I want to write about these dynamics is that it has a PD formulation because we started from some partial differential equation. PD formulation. This one is useful in the proofs, which is the evolution of nu t. It is given by the drift, which is given by the gradient of f. Sorry, gradient of v nu t. And the evolution of the weights that we add another term in the equation, which is minus. Um, v evaluated at nu t times nu t. In the PD uh, community, this is called the drift reaction equation, evolution equation. And this is the one we get. So this is due to the updates of the position. This gives me a drift in my partial differential equation. And this is a term which, if there is no drift, you see this is just somehow a growth or decrease of the, uh, like a growth of the mass by a rate of growth given by this potential V. And this corresponds exactly to the update that we have on the positions. So this has a name. Uh, let me write it. So that if you see it in the literature, remember, it is called the wasserstein fischer rao gradient flow of F. And the name comes from the fact that this evolution can be interpreted as a gradient flow over the space of, of non-negative measures on X, uh, our Riemannian manifold, handled with a certain uh, uh, metric. So we define a metric on the space of, of non-negative measures, which is somehow inf convolution between the Wasserstein and the Fischer metric. So for those who, who like this kind of interpretation, this is a gradient flow uh, of the function. As well. Okay. So now I want to mention one global convergence result that we have for such dynamics. And maybe give a quick idea of the proof. So, theorem uh, assume that V nu t is d times continuously differentiable. Let's stick to the case of the sphere to simplify presentation. So V needs to be D time continuously differentiable and that at initialization nu zero has full support. It means that it has a density which is, I mean, it covers like it, it covers the whole of the sphere as full support. So in particular, this requires to take the mean field limit because you cannot have a finite a discrete measure which has full support on the sphere. This is really an asymptotic statement. 
Uh, then, the statement is that if mu t converges in the weak sense to some measure uh, nu infinity, then nu infinity is nu star, this, uh, the, the global minimizer of my functional f over the space of non-negative measures. This is a weak statement why we do not have any convergence speed and we need to assume convergence. If it converges, then uh, we know that the limit will be a global minimizer. Uh, there is, for finite dimensional gradient flows, there is a lot, a full theory of convergence of gradient flows, but uh, such a theory does not exist in infinite dimensional settings. So, so far, we do not know how to prove that we have convergence, although in general, the counterexamples that we have in finite dimension are very uh, weird functions. Typically, as long as you have some uh, coercivity, the gradient flows do converge. Uh, so maybe to give you an idea of how uh, the proof works, why do we have convert global convergence? So this applies to the case when we have a two-layer neural network with a two homogeneous uh, activation function phi. So first, the global optimality condition is that, uh, let's say, new infinity, what do we know is that this is a stationary point of my evolution equation here, okay? In particular, if I do not look at this term, but only at this one, if I want the evolution to be zero at a stationary point, I need that V, this rate of growth, to be zero, at least on the support of infinity. So we have that uh, V of new infinity uh, equal zero, new infinity almost everywhere. The new infinity can be a discrete measure. I do not know a, a priori. And in fact, there are some cases where it should be. And now the optimality condition, so new star now, this is by definition the minimizer of F. It must satisfy the global optimality condition. And that's why it's useful to have that F is convex because then I can write global optimality condition. We have that V of new star equals zero new star almost everywhere. This is, uh, I'm just writing the optimality condition of this convex problem, which you can derive uh, quite easily. And we have another property because we are on the cone of non-negative measures, which is that V of new star must be larger than zero everywhere. So a priori, there is no reason that the stationary point of this dynamics is a global minimizer because the second property here we do not uh, satisfy it a priori. And there are counterexamples. But now that's where we will use the property that at initialization, we have full support. Then there is a step in the proof that show that we have uh, uh, at all time, new T has full support. And here we use a par par like some uh, representation of the solutions of this PDE. Uh, to prove this claim. And now the last step of the proof goes as follows. Maybe I will write here. Let me start with a, a drawing. We take the uh, one dimensional sphere S1, so this is the torus. And uh, let me take my uh, here. This is V of new infinity, the potential associated to my um, stationary point. And I know that it must cancel at least on the support of new infinity. So, say new infinity is one direct mass located here on the sphere. And here, this is a case where new infinity is not a global minimizer because it takes negative value. So this contradicts the global optimality condition. Now we will uh, do a proof by contradiction. So we know that there will be at least, before I exactly reach new infinity, I will be in a neighborhood of a new infinity. So the potential will look more or less the same, but I have a full support. So there's mass everywhere in particular. There is mass in this area here, okay? So new T, it exists uh, T0. 
such that, uh, and there exists uh, some k, a subset of my uh, sphere, such that mu t0 of k is larger than zero because I have full support, but also v will not change too much starting from this time because I converge to new infinity. And here you look at the updates of uh, the particle's position and you can see that they will all, if I have some a little bit of mass in this area here, this set k between two bumps of the uh, potential, the position of the particles will flow inwards because they follow minus the gradient. And when I have a uh, v which is negative, by the updates, this shows that the mass increases, okay? This gives a positive growth rate. So I'll have that mu t of k will diverge to plus infinity uh, because uh, I have some positive mass which has an exponential increase. Uh, and this contradicts, of course, the fact that, uh, that uh, mu t converges to new infinity. So in fact, you cannot have stationary points with these dynamics, which are not global minimizers. So that's the rough idea of the proof. Uh, then there are several technical details, which I will not go into. That gives you uh, like an idea. You have some questions? No, so here I take any new infinity, which is uh, like in my statement, this is a stationary point of my dynamics. We do a proof by contradiction. Assume that new infinity is not a global minimizer. This means that I, I have the first optimality condition because it's a stationary point. So uh, v, new, v new must vanish at new infinity on the support. However, it might it will have some area where some, uh, some points where it takes negative values because it contradicts the global optimality condition. I want to do a proof by contradiction. And then if we start from such assumptions, we, we can see that the mass of new t will diverge to plus infinity, which contradicts the fact that I convert to new infinity. There are some ways to do this proof without contradiction, uh, but it's a bit longer. But it's not quantitative by nature. So you see, the hard part is that we do not know how to control how much mass there is uh, at this time t0 to know how fast we will escape uh, for this, uh, the neighborhood of stationary points. What it tells, like in practice, this proof is that when you you have you come, come close to stationary points which are not global minimizers, but you are still uh, having mass sufficiently well spread in all directions. Then there will be some mass that will allow to escape from the, the neighborhood of the stationary. Uh, okay, a few more comments. So now I will switch to slides and show you examples of uh, of the various dynamics we discussed about so the two homogeneous cases. This conic conic particle uh, gradient descent, uh, particle gradient flow, or in discrete time, this is conic particle gradient descent. I did not explain what it is, why it is called conic. The basic idea is that... Sorry, can I ask? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah but by homogeneity, like, uh, it's related, in fact. The, the gradient... Uh, um, let's say uh, if you want these two terms to cancel yes no, I mean what you can show is a bit differently as so a quick argument is that if V takes a, a value which is non-zero and the support of new infinity um, let's say I have a measure and I have a point here in the, in the support of new infinity where V uh, is non-zero or even it can have a gradient. Okay. Here you can show that the, uh, the gradient, the, the evolution, like you will have energy decrease. Um, it's not immediate from this formulation. I can write like, you, you, the way you prove it rigorously, this uh, first one, is you, are, you write the energy decrease over the dynamics, so this is the usual squared gradient norm, and you see that these are two terms which are positive. Uh, they, they cannot cancel when you look at the energy decrease. Yeah, at this level, you, could ex you could, cannot exclude that, but where, the, the way to prove it is you look at, like, 
in the energy decrease, these two terms cannot uh, cancel. These are two uh, squared uh, gradients. I can write, uh, yeah, it takes some time. Uh, yeah, uh, just a word about why it's called conic particle gradient descent, because when you have a general Riemannian manifold, you can form its cone, uh, like which is R plus times X, which corresponds to the uh, couple of mass and positions. And on this cone, you can define a metric, which is called the cone metric, which simply corresponds to taking, like if I uh, curve my space somehow and I take the core distance between two points in my product R plus times X, uh, I just take the core distance. This is the cone distance. And this is the geometry that corresponds to this kind of updates when you do the gradient. So in short, if you take the sphere as a basic Riemannian manifold and you take the, the cone of the sphere, pulling this construction, you just get or to the d plus one, and that's why in this case, this is a simple. But there, there is a geometric motivation behind this name. Uh, okay, so now I will share my screen. Uh, maybe we can take the projector, uh, activate the projector, the V. Yeah, the V, this is, um, F is here. Yeah, this is the first variation, the, the, the Fréchet differential, if you want that word. F. No, V is the differential of F. It's a function over my manifold. Yeah. So you can write, you can see it in two ways. Either you want to write your update equations in terms of V, which is not an object you usually have. Like usually you have a problem, you parameterize it in some way, and then you do some backpropagation algorithm. You don't want to compute the gradients, like you want to do formulation. This is when this becomes handy because here this is just the usual gradients you get, the automatic differentiation. What I'm telling you is that you need to do some preconditioning of this form to do this uh, dynamics. Uh, in terms of V, this is uh, what it looks like. There's a slight difference. So I'm sharing my screen, and I will sh now show some uh, examples of uh, the dynamics. So we'll both see the noisy case and the non-noisy case. So while it's turned on, I, I can uh, turning on. I can explain that this statement is quite weak. So for instance, if you remove this uh, drift term, what you have is just uh, uh, evolution with multiplicative updates when you have discretized your, uh, your measure in, in terms of the weights and you fix the position. And then this is a gradient, uh, this is a mirror descent dynamics. Multiplicative updates, this is a mirror descent dynamics. And then we would have convergence speeds as well. So this statement is not telling that this dynamics a priori is better than uh, other ones. It's just that it turns out to work well in practice. Yeah, thank you. And so uh, this statement, it tells us one indication of why it, it could work. But in terms of theoretical guarantees, this is not the best we can get for these kind of problems, of course. So let me start with some examples of dynamics with a conic particle gradient descent. So this is what we've just discussed in the second part. Yeah. There are some proposals of this form. Uh, in fact, uh, so that's, that's a good question. That's a good point. I mean, this could help uh, in practice, um, but this has not been studied too much. So the, this combines Wasserstein and Fischer-Rao. It's not total variation. It's, it's like uh, total variation corresponds to some uh, like uh, maxi. Uh, Coordinate uh, max, like you do the coordinate de gradient descent, like you pick the, the coordinate with the biggest gradient and you only uh, move that particle. Here, these are multiplicative updates, but they are very similar in terms of uh, theoretical guarantee. So this one, if I, if I remove the updates on the grid and I start with a infinite width, a grid, so like a continuous density, I get a continuous mirror flow. Its convergence rate is log t over t, so you, you can have some guarantees. Uh, we'll see that, in fact, this one, when you have both Wasserstein and fischer rao parts, it converges faster locally. At least locally, we have some better guarantees. Globally, uh, there's no, in general, there's no guarantees for this one besides this uh, statement, which is only qualitative. 
Let us look at one example. Here, this is a two-layer ReLU neural network with the same setting as here, where A are the uh, input weights, B, uh, sorry, A are the output weights, B the input weights. So this is a vector in R3, which I'm plotting here, okay? I'm doing a two-dimensional cl two classification task where we want to learn a predictor that separates the pluses and the minuses. This is the training set with labels plus one and minus one. And I will show you the dynamics of all the particles here, which, which corresponds to the WJ in or to the D plus one. Uh, so I've initialized on the sphere. And here, this is not the projected dynamics. So we will see the particles moving away from the sphere. Uh, but there is a hyperbolic tangent radial scale because otherwise the particle will go very far away from the center. Let us look at how it looks like. This statement, it claims that, at least in the infinite twist limit, here I have 400 particles, and we should converge to a global minimizer. And this is the evolution. So this is exactly uh, like this PDE or this kind of equations. And we see that we converge to a, a classifier that perfectly trains the training, classifies the training set, which means we have found the global minimizer. In fact, in this case, I have done a classification with logistic loss. And there are many minimizers that classify perfectly the training set because two-layer neural networks, when they're wide enough, they can approximate any continuous function. But we can prove in this setting, and this is done in this paper, towards which uh, minimizer we converge uh, under the assumption of convergence in the case of an infinite width neural network. And we can explain why you find a predictor which is uh, simple in the sense that it only has a few straight edges, which corresponds to some sparsity at the level of the measure. In fact, this dynamics, it induces uh, implicitly some total variation regularization on the measure, which corresponds to some functional regularization at the level of the predictor. But here, this is not, this statement just claims global convergence. That's the only thing I've talked about. Okay, I will uh, show several applications now. So if you have a question on this one, uh, otherwise I will move to the next one. I have two uh, applications related to uh, three related to conic particle gradient descent. So this was the case where I was just training a two-layer neural network. Now we know that this algorithm can be generalized to more uh, general convex functions on the space of uh, non-negative measures. In fact, it can be generalized to the space of sine measures. I just separate, uh, optimize separately the positive and the negative parts. And you can, for instance, solve the problem of sparse deconvolution. So the problem is as follows. You have a sparse signal mu star. So it's a, a, few, a, few, a few direct masses. So you can think of the problem as trying to, you have a picture of the night sky uh, where you know there are some stars which are point masses, but you only observe a blurry version of it. And your goal is to recover the exact position of the stars given this blurry version and some potentially a noisy version, which is a standard problem in astronomy. Uh, so, you, uh, you uh, model, model this as a star signal, a sign measure that you want to recover. So, in the case of stars, this is only a positive, non negative measure. Yeah? A sparse measure is, a, let's say, a, a discrete measure with a finite number of atoms. Um, and you observe a, a, like a blurry version of it. So, you have a filter phi, some convolution you apply to your signal, and potentially some noise. So you observe F, which is the signal here in uh, yellow. This is uh, F, it means F is large, and uh, blue, it's, it's when F is small. And you want to recover, just observing this uh, continuous signal, the position of the stars, which are three uh, here. And one way to do that, and this is proposed in the statistics community, is to solve this problem where you uh, try to recover mu, by recovering the good signal using the L2 uh, reconstruction loss plus some total variation regularization. And this is an objective function F. Uh, to make it uh, work in this setting, just separate the positive and the negative part of, of the measure mu. Here, in fact, I just did the positive parts. And then you can do this conic particle gradient descent. So here I've initialized on a regular grid in the two-dimensional torus. The uh, points represent the positions of the particles. But since their mass will also vary, I represent their mass with the size of the particle, okay? So this is how the dynamics evolves. Oops, sorry. And we see that both the masses and the position vary. 
And in the end, we converge to, in fact, a global minimizer of F. And since there is some regularization, this is not exactly the signal that we have, uh, the ground truth signal. This is a little bit of bias due to the regularization. But that's the global minimizer of F. And here it seems to work very well. And in fact, so that's a, a question uh, uh, that I tried to understand. Yes? So far, I just have uh, F does not assume that uh, mu star is sparse, except that this regularization, regularization will tend to favor sparse solutions. In fact, in the statistics community, there is a guarantee that if the stars are sufficiently far away for certain uh, uh, noisy, uh, like uh, certain noise levels and convolution kernels, you can guarantee that the minimizer of F is not so far away from uh, the true uh, ground truth. Yeah. So you can think like if you discretize the, the square and you put one weight on each of the cells of the pixel, then TV total variation does something as the L1 norm of the weight on each of these pixels. It's a continuous version of the L1 norm, total variation. Um, in fact, there is an explanation for this uh, good behavior. Uh, so here we'll briefly go uh, towards this result. I just want to, to show what kind of things we can say about this kind of dynamics. So in fact, in this setting of a sparse problem where you have a non-degenerate minimizer, so these are conditions that can be checked uh, if the particles are sufficiently far away, then there is some sub-level starting from which this conic particle gradient descent will converge at an exponential rate to the minimizer, and the rate is independent of the number of particles you have. So it's an infinite dimensional statement. If you want. And this is uh, like much better than convex dynamics, which will converge. In fact, you will pay a curse of uh, like discretization cost. You cannot re really recover the good position because with a convex approach, you need to discretize. But also, the convergence rate would be even slower. So this is much better in this setting. Uh, there is another example, which I will uh, skip over. But you can apply these dynamics to find uh, mixed Nash equilibria. You have uh, of continuous gain. So you have a, a payoff function f defined on uh, a strategy space for one player X and the second player Y, and uh, you want to find their mixed Nash equilibria. So there is no uh, guarantee so far of algorithms which are uh, converging, like polynomial in the um, log one over epsilon. If epsilon is the uh, regular, the, sorry, the precision you want on the solution, it turns out that this conic particle gradient descent they do that. There are some subtlety because in min max game you cannot do. Uh, continuous time dynamics. So I wanted to, to switch to not talk about that one, but now let me give some example of the noisy case. So these are the dynamics we have discussed before. I remove all the homogeneity assumption or the variations of the masses. We only have particles and noisy gradient descent on their, uh, uh, on their positions. So let us see how it looks like. In the, in the lecture two, I, mentioned the global convergence behavior. So here, this is a, an illustration where you have uh, the two-dimensional torus as a domain X. And I consider an energy F of nu, which is convex. This is, uh, if you know about it, the kernel mean discrepancy with some Dirichlet kernel. Uh, this is also, this can be interpreted as a negative Sobol F norm. This is an energy of interaction between the particles where mu star is a fixed measure. And uh, mu is the one I optimize over. And the global minimizer of this function f is mu star in that case. OK? So these are particles, like the particles of mu, they repulse each other while they are attracted by the particles of mu star. So if I simply do uh, particle gradient descent, this is this panel here, we'll see that it does not converge globally. And here I do noisy particle gradient descent, the one we talked about in lecture two with a little bit of uh, noise annealing, and we'll observe the global convergence. This one has no noise. This is particle gradient descent. There's, in general, no guarantee in this case. Well, this is with the noise, and I have done some annealing. In the end, I killed the noise just to show uh, clearly the, uh, that the final configuration is uh, quite good. OK, so this is a, yeah. Is that the X dot? Yeah, oh, yeah, I did not explain that. Yeah, red dots are the support of new star, and the black dots are the, part, the support of new. 
and they all have the uniform mass, like this, all the direct masses with the same number, same mass. Uh, I will now show some uh, other applications. So this case, in fact, is quite representative of uh, neural networks because for neural networks, with a two layer, you can show that the objective corresponds to some kernel mean discrepancy. Another uh, example of application is to compute the barycenters of royalty measures. Uh, I will just take one or two minutes more. So let's assume that you have new k, new one, new two, etc., until new k, a family of k probability measure on your space, let's say r to the d, and you want to compute a notion of barycenters between these probability measures. There are various notions you can define, but one which is useful in certain contexts is the uh, Wasserstein barycenter. So here we go very fast. Uh, I, I mostly want to show you some animations. But the definition of the Wasserstein distance between mu and mu, like the square of Wasserstein distance, this is this, where gamma is a, a, a transport plane between mu and mu. And here I consider the regularized uh, optimal transport, because if I want to have some regularity assumption for my problem, I need to regularize it. That makes the problem uh, tractable numerically as well. And we, we define the barycenter objective as the sum, the weighted sum, if I want a weighted barycenter, of the distance between mu and mu k. So mu is my the barycenter I look for, I'm trying to find, and mu k the fixed marginals. And this gives an objective function over the space of priority measures. It turns out that it's convex. It's not obvious from its formulation here, but there is uh, some, uh, you can prove it's convex. And when we apply a, a particle gradient descent on this objective, this is what we get. So here we have no guarantee of convergence because there is no homogeneity, nor there is noise. And this converge to this uh, particle. So let me explain here a bit what we see. Uh, we have three measures, in one in blue, new one, one in green, new two, and one in orange, new three. And I want to compute their barycenter, which will be these particles in black, mu. And the one we are looking for, it looks a bit like that because uh, this is a barycenter of these three measures, okay, believe me. Uh, when you do the Wasserstein barycenter, it looks a bit like that. When I do uh, noisy particle gradient descent, here we have a global convergence guarantee if I have a sufficient level of noise. And in fact, something uh, I just mentioned here briefly is that the noise in this setting, in fact, allows to debias the problem. Because when we regularize with this entropy Wasserstein distance, we induce some bias. And the uh, noise in the dynamics, we can prove that it uh, allows to remove the bias. So you see that the limit of this dynamics is much, it's very different from the true Wasserstein barycenter, while the limit of this one with the noise is much closer to the true Wasserstein barycenter. In fact, we can show that we gain one order of approximation with a correct level of noise. And I will skip, there is another, other examples. Let me jump to the conclusion, just to summarize a bit what we have seen in these lectures. In general, particle gradient descent, if you have no structure, it's, uh, there is no global convergence or local convergence results, even if you assume that F is convex. So we, we are working on a, on a paper where we, we have some results of this sort, but you'll see that there are also some strong assumptions. And they are useful to uh, minimize over space of quality measures. Now, if I add some noise, in the lecture two, we have seen that we can have global convergence using this log sobolev inequality. But this is to regularize a uh, solution because there is this uh, additional entropy in the objective function. And now when you have conic particle gradient descent, you have convergence, global convergence in a qualitative meaning, like in the mean field uh, limit. It's not quantitative. And we have also some local convergence results, in particular in this case of, of sparse problems I've mentioned in the slide. And this case allows also to uh, optimize over the space of non-negative measures and also the sign measures. So here I gave some uh, selected references, just I picked one reference uh, which is relevant for each of the uh, lectures, uh, which you, if you want to see more details and also all the rigorous uh, statements. And I thank you for your attention. Yeah. For all noise or factors, we have to choose it carefully. So, uh, yeah, so in fact, here, a good choice of noise level. We hear lambda will be my level of regularization in the Wasserstein problem. So for those who do not know Wasserstein, it will be a bit abstract because we did not really define these equations. I introduced some regularization in the optimal transport problem for the lambda. 
you need to choose tau to be equal to lambda over two if you want to gain one order of approximation. So this is uh, in, in this recent paper of mine. And uh, lambda here can be anything. It's just when lambda is very large, you tend to obtain only very blurry Paris centers. Uh, so far, we only are able to, I mean, you get still an object. It's a notion of Barry center, uh, but it's unclear what is its imp interpretation. So, uh, yeah, there's no clear uh, choice of lambda, uh, which I can tell you. Right. So the question is, uh, can we uh, use this theory to, uh, for the case of deeper neural networks? So uh, the simple answer is not at all because the fact that we have probability measures is really related to the fact we have, that we have a one hidden layer neural network. Um, so for deeper neural network, we can take infinite width uh, limits as well. So this will be discussed in Greg Young's lecture, I assume. Uh, so this, you, you will hear about it a lot. And in short, in these infinite width limits, it's much harder to get asymptotic statements in time. So the fact that we have a convergence theory or some local convergence theory, it's really specific to the two-layer case. It's unclear whether we will be able to do that for deeper neural networks. But there are other insights that we can get for deep neural networks, and this you will hear in uh, Greg Young's lecture. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is whether we can maybe change a bit the dynamics of deep neural networks to, uh, to use this theory. So there are, in fact, several works. Uh, there is a mean field theory of deep neural networks. Uh, so there are many things you can do. For instance, you can do layer was training or things like that. Uh, the short answer is that these dynamics are usually very different from what you would do in practice or what uh, is the state of the art. Uh, it's mostly a problem of scalings. And again, this will be discussed by, by Greg. But um, so there are many things we can do theoretically, but the link with practice and also the state of the art uh, of neural networks is... is uh, very unclear, I would say. Ah, um, so the question is, did we uh, like refine this theory to deal with maybe finer constraints or, um, or like second order methods maybe? Like, yeah, there are, all these refinements I think are possible. Like this is just a, a general framework. Uh, some of them are just a matter of putting things together. But some of them are, are more uh, fundamental. So for instance, those who work on sampling, they know that sampling uh, measures which satisfy like say log Sobolev inequalities, but on a compact uh, subset, so a constrained uh, sampling, a co compact convex set, at the level of the time discretization, this is very tricky. So at the level of continuous time, these things, they handle well many variations. But when you start to worry about time discretization, so far we can only do very nicely the, the, the case, let's say, on R to the D without constraints. But we would encounter the same difficulties as we have when we do a sampling of love concave measures, so the case where F is linear. And I assume that whatever fixes are found in that setting could probably be extended in the nonlinear setting where F is found. So these are, yeah, I, I would, my philosophy would be to tackle these problems in the simplest case where they, they appear uh, before actually trying to do them in this more general. Yeah, there are many refinements which are possible. These are quite recent developments. Okay, so I think this is time for the pause. Thank you for your attention. And if you have more questions, you can always come to talk to me. Thank you.